Greetings and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stoliaroff II, and I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Here we hold conversations with some of the world's leading thinkers in longevity, science, technology, philosophy, and politics. Like the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, we aim to connect every field of human endeavor and arrive at new insights to achieve longer lives, greater rationality, and the progress of our civilization. <clears throat> Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon of January 14th, 2024. Today, we are pleased to bring to you this session, which will discuss developments in transhumanism and transhumanist advocacy on the African continent. And joining us today is our distinguished panel, including several U.S. Transhumanist Party officers, our Director of Visual Art, Art Ramon Garcia, our Director of Longevity Outreach, Ben Balweg, our Director of Citizen and Community Science, and our 2024 U.S. Vice Presidential Candidate, Daniel Tweed. Joining us from Belgium is our friend and frequent guest on the Virtual Enlightenment Salons from AFT Techno Prague and Heels, Didier Kernel. And Didier has helped us to assemble this panel of transhumanists from Africa. We have joining us today Josiah Akinloye, who is the founder and CEO of Main Logics Technology Limited in Nigeria. We have Josue Gabo, who is the president of the Société Ivorienne de Transhumanisme, or SIVOT, from Côte d'Ivoire. We have Frederick Onwuka from Nigeria, who is the author of The Great View of the Future, How AI Will Give Us a New Perspective. And we also hope to have several other African transhumanists joining us today. Uh, Haman and Adama Debuzi, who is a student researcher in the Department of Philosophy and the Faculty of Arts, Letters, and Human Sciences in the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon. And Brenda Ramakapelwa, who is the CEO of Tafts, the Transdisciplinary Agora for Future Discussions. Brenda has been our guest on multiple virtual enlightenment salons as well. So hopefully they will join us when their internet connections allow. But in the meantime, let us go to Josiah for his opening remarks. Uh, Josiah, what would you like to tell us about your outlooks on transhumanism as well as transhumanism as it exists on the African continent, advocacy efforts toward it, how it has advanced in your experience. All right, thank you very much, Denari, for the introduction. Hi, I'm Josiah Kenoye. I am a member of the Enlightenment Transhumanist Nigeria. And talking about transhumanism in Africa and in Nigeria generally, we've been able to uh, organize and sensitize people about latest technology and innovative region around transhumanism technologies like uh, longevity, anti-aging, human enhancement, and the like. So transhumanism in uh, Nigeria and Africa has been growing little by little, but uh, not really as we think. So we are just looking to approach transhumanism in Africa with another dimension, because we notice uh, here in Africa, we like culture and uh, form of entertainment. So. Uh, part of our plan, we are looking to also approach transhumanism from the aspect of culture and uh, entertainment perspective. Yes, thank you, Josiah. And 
I'm curious, how long have you been involved in the transhumanist movement? When did you first learn about transhumanism and what inspired you to delve into it further? All right, thank you for that. Uh, 2012 or 2013, when I was in school, I had an uncle who just suddenly got blind without any form of uh, pre-notification or anything. So we, we were like, what could happen? We visited diverse hospitals, uh, sick medical councils and the like. But unfortunately, you know, based on what I said earlier that we are African and we focus much on our culture and uh, also entertainment. Some people say maybe spiritual attack and the like. So I went online to start doing some research and I happened to be quite interested in robotic skills. I was of the opinion that we have smart camera, we have embedded chip camera. We can make a camera and find a way we can synchronize this camera to the brain so that people with uh, physical uh, challenges like uh, implant, uh, physical challenges with their eyes, we can use camera and synchronize the pictorial image to their brain. So doing that research, uh going online i dedicated about two hours of my time per day because of course i'm still in school so i came across transhumanism which talks about different topics and the topics ranging from cryogenic uh growing of artificial limbs uh bow biotechnology even immortality so i was fascinated about this theory and uh, the organization. So I go more deep with the research in the transhumanism field. Each time I do a lot of research, I find something new. So that's what fascinated me about transhumanism. So and since then, I've been looking for uh, different organizations. I look for different organizations since 2013. I just register, I went on Facebook, I put my, I edited my profile to be a transhumanism. And since then I've been connecting with uh, major transhumanists, uh, advocates in Nigeria and Africa. And since then, that's how I've been growing in the transhumanism still. And moreover, I've been quite interested in the industrial free field because I am not an academia. I don't really want to be in the academic field. So I am so much in the industrial and the entrepreneurial field of transhumanism. So that's what part of what brings uh, the idea of smart home and internet of things, connecting devices and controlling things from a uh, smartphone remotely and even at ease to give security and safety to users and to advance technology for humanity. Yes, thank you very much, Josiah, for that answer. And it is quite interesting that the desire to overcome disabilities is what attracted you to transhumanism in the first place. And after that, you branched out to discover all of the various pursuits and implications of transhumanism. Along these lines, Ben Balweg has shared this interesting article from ARPA-H, which is the new Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health in the United States. And this article is entitled, ARPA-H Launches Research Program to Restore Sight to People Who Are Blind. So these kinds of endeavors are already underway, and that is quite interesting. So thank you, Josiah, for sharing your story. And now we'll open it up to questions for Josiah. Didier, if you have something to ask Josiah, please go ahead. Uh, well, not uh, really at the moment. Uh, I would like to ask maybe after all, uh, 
African participants were speaking, just to say that uh, it's uh, really great to see the uh, the work of uh, transhumanists that's really not easy in Africa. And I know that there will be, uh, at the end of the year, uh, um, longevist and uh, uh, transhumanist uh, uh, conference in uh, Lagos in October. Maybe you can say a few uh, more words about that uh, if you are already involved. Uh, yeah, that's my main question for the moment. All right, thank you. Uh, I am a member of the Enlightenment Transhumanist Zemov, Nigeria, and we've been looking to organize a conference uh, in partnership. We are looking to also even partner with uh, South people of Osinakachi because uh, it's of late we just realized Osinakachi is planning to organize a conference in Nigeria. So we are looking to collaborate together. But be preceding that, we are open to host a virtual conference in transhumanism, especially to sensitize people on transhumanism and also against the upcoming conference that is coming later on this year. And if we had a discussion yesterday because we hold a meeting in the transhumanism uh, forum for we Africa. So we discussed that part of the approach we can use is through entertainment and culture. If we can have some kind of way to communicate transhumanism to people through entertainment and culture. As you know, Afrobeat is uh, what most people listen to all virtually everywhere in the world. So if we can uh, mix transhumanism to be part of our culture, we can communicate to larger people. Thank you. All right, thank you, Josiah. And now I propose that we hear from Josue Gabo regarding his activities in Cote d'Ivoire. So Josue, welcome. Uh, what would you like to say about transhumanism in Cote d'Ivoire, as well as what inspired you to venture into transhumanism? Thank you. I want to say that we have created uh, our organization in September, and we want uh, to, 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 to make in the same place all the researchers living in Cote d'Ivoire uh, to open a reflection in the op op synoptic and transversal analysis of um, main technological development related to the modification to the human subject. We think that the, trans the transhumanism is a, a conception very uh, difficult for us. In Cote d'Ivoire, we don't speak about uh, transhumanism, so we we wanted to, to try to explain to our uh, to Ivorians that it's very important that we have to know transhumanism because when we are in the world and uh, somewhere we are speaking about the development of a human being and Ivorians are not uh, concerned uh, it's very difficult for us. So we wanted to explain to all Ivorians the importance of the transhumanism. It's why we have created the, this uh, organization. Excellent. Thank you very much, Josue. And now, uh, per Didier's uh, expressed desire to hear introductory statements from all of the African transhumanists who are here at least at this time. Let's hear from Frederick Anwuka, who is in Nigeria. And Frederick has written quite an interesting book, The Great View of the Future, How AI Will Give Us a New Perspective. So Frederick, if you could comment on what led you to discover transhumanism, as well as your thoughts about the current state of transhumanism in Africa and its potential. 
Let's see. And I think we need to unmute you. Uh, Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Mauro Kafka. Um, basically, I read transhumanism from social media. Likewise, from my friend, social media friend, Jenna Minsky, Estella Roy, and from those um, through their posts, I see them online on Facebook. So I took interest in that regard to be able to look towards the direction of transhumanism. And what I realized so far in Africa is that transhumanism in Africa has little penetration in Africa. As well. So we need a lot of um, awareness campaigns that will make transhumanism more popular amongst Africans. So we need a, a like a wide, a city-wide, um, let's say a continental-wide awareness campaign in Africa, so that everyone in Africa could understand what transhumanism entails. And during my discovery, I I discovered some some disadvantage and some weaknesses, some lapses that makes transhumanism so low, having low penetration in Africa. For example, there's an acronym that I developed or devised. Yeah, I developed, so to speak. Uh, I call this freak. Freak, that is F R E A K. Now, what is freak? The S stands for funds. In Africa, for example, transhumanism in Africa is very poor because there's uh, uh, no funds to um, bring about the awareness I, I was talking about. Another one is research. We don't really have research uh, facilities here in Africa that could encourage indigenous um, 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 persons to take part in transhumanism research and development. Another one is uh, E, which stands for endowment. What are the endowments? Endowment in the sense that endowment in supporting transhumanism research in universities, supporting our, our institutions. There are brilliant people in Africa universities that we can use other um, other foreign countries, countries that have advanced in, in the aspect of transhumanism. We can easily uh, support them because here in Africa there's a low turnout turn there. So in the regard of endowment, to go a long way to facilitate the uh, the penetration of transhumanism in Africa. So we need endowment here in Africa in supporting transhumanism in Africa in high institutions. The another one is A, which means we stand for accelerated indigenous innovations. What, what did I mean by accelerated indigenous innovations? Uh, innovators, sorry. Accelerated indigenous innovators are like locals, indigenous innovators that can really improve the awareness of transhumanism in Africa doing research. So we need that also. Then the last one is knowledge sharing through transcontinental partnership. Uh, there's something, there's a bridge, there's a gap between Africa and, and the advanced world. The way, Af uh, the way the advanced world see Africa is very poor. So in this regard now, we need a, a thorough partnership between the advanced world and Africa, so to speak. So we need that collaboration in the, in the aspect of knowledge sharing through continental partnership. The, the, those countries that have really advanced in the aspect of uh, trans, uh, transhumanism needs to es export their um, intellectual and intelligence here in Africa so that it will grow the participation of locals, indigenous uh, local people that are interested in transhumanism in Africa. So another one, is, there are some points here I highlighted here. I highlighted some points here. One of the causes of a uh, lack of transhumanism the spread of transhumanism in Africa is early enlightenment to promote awareness through educational programs, workshops, media campaigns to highlight the positive impact of transhumanism in human longevity and well-being. These are one of the criteria that we need approaches to be able to penetrate transhumanism in Africa. Another one is one of the barriers is cultural and religious sensitization. In Africa, yeah, we are we are traditional. We are traditional more than any other parts of the world. So cultural religion sensitization is very important to foster open dialogues, 
to challenge and reshape rigid cultural norms and religious beliefs that may hinder acceptance. Another one here is uh, the third point here is a um, vision plan for intellectual intellectuals to develop a comprehensive vision plan or roadmap that aligns with societal goals, emphasizing the potential benefits of transhumanism. Engage intellectuals and thought leaders in discussion to gather support and promote understanding. This is also uh, something that we are lacking here in Africa and uh, with the rest of the world. There's no vision plan here for transhumanism here in Africa. That's why we have low penetration of, of the awareness of transhumanism in Africa. The fourth point here is um, investment and research consortium. Establish both private and public investment research consortium, encouraging collaboration between government, private sectors, and academic. Pooling funds and resources can accelerate research and development in transhumanist technologies. This is also something that we are lacking here in, in Africa, which is um, trying to hinder the penetration of transhumanism in Africa. The fifth point is local research support. Here we lack that local research support in times of fund initiative within higher education institution. As I said in my previous uh, introductory part, comments rather, encourage indigenous research and educators to incorporate transhumanists into their curriculums, fostering knowledge base that aligns with global advancements. Then, in conclusion, by combining education cultural sensitivity, strategic planning, financial support, and research initiative, Africa can actively contribute to the realization of a future that extends human life and improve overall well-being of, of, of our burgeoning population. So these are some of the points I highlight towards the coupling the needs of transhumanism here in Africa. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Frederick, for those remarks. And now there's an interesting question that has arisen from several of our viewers, and there have been some comments in the chat about it as well. Daniel Tweed wonders, how much of a barrier to progress is having a common language in Africa? Is English fairly widely spoken in most parts of Africa nowadays? And François Joanneau writes that, in his view, most Africans understand either French or English. Siba Chamuza, our foreign ambassador in Togo, who also speaks English, French, and German, wonders if the language barrier can find solutions in technology. So I'm curious what our African panelists think about this. Uh, do you think that the majority of Africans would be able to understand uh, either English or French or uh, perhaps even German? And these are languages in which there has been a lot of communication of transhumanist thought. So Josue, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, my thought is that... Um, oh, I think we, that we can, we can write, but we can speak. We cannot speak. <laughs> technology can help us to write, to translate uh, what we, we are speaking about, but to speak, it's very difficult to, 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 to help us. But I, I think that technology can help us to write. Translation is very easily made by, by, uh, by writing. But I'm not yes. sure uh, technology will help us to, to speak uh, uh, very easily, uh, the different languages. Well, I think, Josue, you are quite articulate. Your command of English is very good. So uh, you are one of the people in Africa who can definitely promote these ideas effectively. And Frederick, you were uh, making some remarks on this as well. So please go ahead. I think, um, as we said earlier, as Webo said earlier, we need technology that can suit local language, that can break the local language barrier. Uh, so, um, because in Africa, we have the Francophone speaking 
Africans and the Anglo folks speaking Africa. So there's a cultural barrier already. They, uh, they, this, this is creating that barrier whereby uh, the penetration of transhumanism in Africa is not really high, it's not really on the high side. So if we can, um, if there's a technology that could bring that could break that barrier, then I think transhumanism in Africa will go smooth on fair. So that is my remark for now. And some supports from foreign aid, like supporting um, high institutions in Africa to carry out research based on transhumanism um, because it's very low over here. So that's why we are lacking it. That's why we are lacking the penetration of transhumanism in Africa. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Frederick. And Josiah, do you have any thoughts on the language question? Yeah. Yes, I have some things to talk about. On the language in Nigeria, English is our common language outside our mother's language. Like the part I am from, Yoruba, Yoruba is my mother's son, and that's the first uh, language I speak since the day I was born. So, but people, aside transhumanism, people have been trying to uh, I happen to have a friend on LinkedIn who teaches data science in our mother tongue. I guess as transhumanism, as transhumanist, we can also interpret the core objective what transhumanism is all about to people in our local dialect. That's how we can bridge uh, the gap. Yes, thank you, Josiah. And we also have an interesting set of comments from our foreign ambassador in Togo, Siba Chamuza. I will bring those comments up as I think they will add to the discussion. Siba writes, I admire the initiatives that are emerging to promote transhumanism in Africa, and I hope for the ambitious commitment of local structures and donors to support technological awakening. Very well put. But Siba also writes, even in the West, the word transhumanism is still very little known. And that has been my observation as well. When I speak to the general public in Western countries about transhumanism, the number one reaction is not fear or aversion. It's simple unawareness. Most people don't know what that term means. And on the one hand, that offers us an opportunity because if we are the first point of contact in terms of the ideas of transhumanism for such people, then we can convey an accurate impression of what it means. On the other hand, it also means we have a large, considerably sizable task ahead of us in terms of getting these ideas across, in terms of cultivating this awareness. And I think this will be a subject of continued discussion that we should explore in this salon as well. I would also like to welcome in our chat our friend Osunakachi Akuma Kalu from Tafts, the Transdisciplinary Agora for Future Discussions, as well as Afro Longevity. So, welcome. Osanakachi, uh, we would be happy to have your insights in the chat as well. So DGA, now that we've heard those presenters who have been able to join our stream thus far, what are your questions or comments? Well, maybe the, 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 the first comment, since we are speaking about uh, languages in Africa, is for... Uh, I think the majority, or at, uh, but certainly a big part of uh, uh, African people, uh, French or English, is only the second or even some sometimes the third language. So it is it is uh, uh, an enrichment uh, to see people speaking many different languages. For example, in uh, South Africa, they are I forgot now eleven or twelve uh, official languages. And uh, Brenda, who is uh, sadly not here, told me that she spoke, uh, I forget, but four or five uh, uh, languages. 
So this is one uh, first, uh, one quite uh, uh, first important uh, uh, remark that we can have more uh, exchange, more uh, enrichment uh, in some, in many African uh, countries than in other countries where people speak only or mostly one language. Uh, yeah, that's the first comment. The second comment is, uh, I think we didn't speak about this uh, yet, but probably the biggest uh, uh, difference, one of the big, big differences concerning the, the perception of uh, technological progress in Africa and in some in other countries, let's say uh, in the South, even if it's not always in the South, but again, in the South, and uh, countries in the north is that the general perception of technological uh, progress is more positive in the south than in the north. And it's always, uh, in some aspects, uh, uh, kind of difficult to, uh, to understand because in the north we have, uh, uh, we benefit more uh, of technological progress because we have uh, the chance to have. Uh, yeah, a higher level of uh, of goods, let's say. So, why? What do you think? Why is is it that uh, the general perspective about uh, progress is is um, better in uh, Africa? Is it because people are younger? Is it uh, because there is more uh, potential progress that you can hope? I don't know. I, I sometimes I really don't know, uh, and I'm uh, I'm curious about uh, uh, your answers for this. Yes. So this is a good question, and I think right now we have Josiah and Frederick on. So I'm curious what your thoughts are uh, with regard to DDA's inquiry. Why does it seem that technological progress is actually better? viewed in the global south as compared to the global north and in Africa, for instance, as compared to Europe or the United States. Any hypotheses in that regard? Let's All see. right. So I will say we are still coming up in Africa because most of the technology advancement in the Western world has gone really far. We are just coming up. And as you know, the part of the Africa I came from, which is Nigeria, there are still a lot of people who are still not that really educated about all these technologies. So majorly part of our challenges here in Africa education is uh, a part of it, which they contribute to the advancement in uh, technology. Yes, thank you, Josiah. And any thoughts from Frederick or Josue on DDA's observation that it seems that technological progress is better received in Africa than it is right now in Europe or the United States? Yes. So, any comments on that observation? Do you think it's true, or do you think uh, it depends on uh, whom one is speaking to? Uh, no comment. No comment. No. No comment. Okay, Frederick. Any thoughts on this? Let's see. I think he disconnected, unfortunately. But Frederick did share something in the comments, an acronym where F stands for funds, R stands for research and deployment, E stands for endowments, A stands for accelerated indigenous innovations, and K stands for knowledge sharing through transcontinental partnerships. So the acronym does read FREAK, but it's really I think a combination of prerequisites that Frederick considers to be important to foster the spread of 
transhumanism and technology in Africa. So thank you, Frederick, for sharing that. Now, my own thinking on technological progress and how it is perceived is that in Africa right now, the benefits of technological progress are so obvious and palpable. And Africans can see if they get cell phones, if they get clean drinking water, if they get higher quality roads, if they get buildings that are created through modern construction techniques, that constitutes an immense improvement to their quality of life. Africans have seen life expectancy increase tremendously over the past several decades. And as a result, Africans see the life-saving, life-extending benefits of technology to a greater extent than Westerners who are steeped in technology, but who have not been able to optimally advance technological progress past the current stage because we have so many institutional problems in the Western world, certainly in the United States and in mm -hmm. countries of the European Union. And as a result, we failed to further push forward the progress of technology to the point where we would visibly see improvements in our day-to-day -day standards of living. Instead, in the Western world, we face continual increases in the cost of living. We face continual scarcity of basic goods. We see our infrastructure breaking down very often. So while in Africa, the living standards may be starting from a lower point, but Africans have seen the effects of technology very clearly, we have seen kind of the opposite, a long stagnation that has lasted since, uh, I would say, the early 1970s in many areas of life, other than computers and the internet and electronic communications and AI, artificial intelligence. Those have been the exceptions. But that's my hypothesis as to the difference that DDA observes. So now we have some other observations that I think would be good to bring in. Carlos Nato writes that usually religions tend to clash with a future-oriented focus in his view, and Latin America suffers significantly from this problem. He wonders if religion is a problem for focusing on the future of technology in Africa as well, and our viewer Transhuman Ape wonders about the natural fallacies of religion and popular ideologies would you say those stand in the way of transhumanism or could they be compatible with transhumanism in Africa? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, okay. Religion and technology in Africa or transhumanism in Africa, they have been a kind of uh conspiracy especially between the religious leader and the technology world. Uh there have been some religious sects who uh sometimes they go they don't even want their uh followers, their church member to even watch TV, take for instance. But when they started seeing the benefits as against the disadvantages they are preaching against, they started uh, buying into the idea. Well, a couple of weeks ago, a popularly known pastor came out and apologized to his followers, saying he's sorry about not allowing his former lawyers to use television sets. That was back about 20 something or 30 something years ago. So sometimes religion is also a barrier to advancement in technology in Africa and also transhumanism as a whole. So, because we, Africa, like I said earlier, we believe so much in our culture and our culture also is also mixed with our religion. So, it's of late that people started having this thought and change of mind 
due to the internet of things and having a direct access to the outside world. So that's basically what I can say about that. Yes, thank you, Josiah. And it is quite startling that some religious leaders in Africa were even discouraging their followers from watching television, utilizing much older technologies. But it seems that at least some of them are coming around to recognizing that that may be futile or undesirable. Interestingly enough, one of our friends within the transhumanist community is Dr. Charles Awuzi, who is a former pastor, but he became a transhumanist and an atheist. And he has since used a lot of the same persuasive techniques, but oriented toward advancing transhumanism rather than disparaging it. So there is hope that these ideas could gain traction and maybe even some of the religious leaders could be persuaded to give transhumanism a chance. Any other thoughts from our African guests about religion and transhumanism and the impact of religion on the spread of transhumanism in Africa? Either Frederick or Josue, would you like to say something? Let's see. Uh, to, to me, uh, traditional African are not against transhumanist, but uh, Christians uh, in Africa uh, used to perceive the transhumanist or philosophy in general like a, a satanist thing. Uh, uh, I, I used to, to hear that uh, transhumanist is, a, is um, a way to, to take the place of God. Man want to take the place of God. I used to hear to, to hear some some sort of of, of uh, words sometimes. So in traditional Afri Africa, I don't think that uh, people are against transhumanism. But uh, with the the new perception perception of religion, Christian religion, uh, I think that uh, Africans can be against uh, transhumanism. Is, is perceived like a, a satanist thing. Take the place of God. That sort of thing I used to, to hear here in Cote d'Ivoire. Yes. Thank you, Josue. And that is a very interesting observation. So the traditional religions are not really hostile to transhumanism, but various, let's say, fundamentalist strains of Christianity in Africa can associate it with Satanism or trying to take the place of God. And Daniel Tweed wonders in our chat whether there are Satanists, transhumanists. There was one article in the Immortalist magazine in 2020, I believe, by B.J. Murphy, who uh, identified as a Satanist, transhumanist. But Satanism, as he described it is a very specific interpretation in the United States, and it's mostly just secularism with a bit of irreverence. So it's not that they literally worship Satan. It's that they want to uh, kind of poke holes in the Christian religion and say, well, this character of Satan, he's not really that bad, but really they're just secularists. And honestly, if one were to examine their views, they wouldn't be that far from atheists. So that's probably not the kind of Satanism that the Christian pastors uh, whom Josue was talking about are afraid of. And Ben Balweg uh, asks, Josue, it would seem that people in Côte d'Ivoire are more familiar with transhumanism than uh, I would have expected. Or is it only after you explain transhumanism to them that people feel such things about it? So I think the question is, before you have a chance to speak with them, do they have any sort of knowledge of transhumanism? Or uh, is there 
impression based on what you tell them. Any thoughts on this? And we can come back to that as well. But Didier, it looks like you would like to offer some comments. Yeah, uh, two two comments. Maybe first, uh, yeah, uh, if Armand uh, was here, he would speak uh, about uh, the what his one of his uh, main goals. So Armand and Katsetka from uh, Cameroon, uh, who uh, recently organized. Uh, uh, a conference about uh, uh, longevity. So uh, he um, considers that uh, one of his goals is to make the link between uh, uh, transhumanist ideas and uh, uh, ideas related to uh, traditions in, uh, in Africa, especially in Cameroon. And this is very interesting. Uh, I uh, will not speak for uh, for him because he knows better than than uh, I know. But he said that there are some uh, common aspects. That's the the first thing I wanted to say. And the uh, second thing is, uh, yeah, we have to be careful when uh, we uh, use uh, some uh, words about uh, uh, related transhuman to transhumanism because. Uh, even when we say that for kind of a joke, people can uh, perceive this this as this is really the case, and it's not the case. So let's uh, a reminder for most transhumanists, uh, even or almost all transhumanists, the number one goal is to make it possible for people to live uh, longer and uh, much longer and uh, much healthier lives, uh, and to uh, improve ourselves. Uh, uh, in uh, enhancing ourselves, but not against the others, to to work with others, to work together, and to be more, also, yeah, let's say more humans. We we have to, uh, and uh, when people are, sp are saying, uh, speaking about uh, other things, very often it's kind of a, a joke. And we have, once again, we have to be careful uh, to remind what are the uh, main goals of uh, most uh, transhumanists. That's it. Yes. Thank you, Didier. And we do have a response from Josue to our uh, question from Ben. And Josue writes, in general, people equate all freedom of thought and innovation with transgression. So when you explain the aims of transhumanism to them, they say, ah, here's another transgression, hence diabolism or the association with Satan. And that is interesting that there are, it seems many people in Africa who are so in the grip of this fundamentalist Christianity that any significant innovation seems transgressive to them. And on the one hand, innovation is transgressive against established dogma. On the other hand, innovation aims to improve human life and reduce suffering and reduce mortality. And those should be obviously good goals. And there are various interpretations of religions, including the Christian religion, which say, it is a moral imperative to alleviate suffering. It is a moral imperative to heal the sick or give sight to the blind, which is exactly what transhumanist technologies are aimed at doing. So perhaps there is a way to speak about this that could diminish some of those connotations of something diabolical and rather focus on the common goals that we have with adherence of various religions. And we also have some interesting comments from our friend Osinakachi Akuma Kalu, and he kind of challenges the unitary outlook on Africa. He writes that at first, Africa shouldn't be addressed as an entity. Africans are divided among tribal lines. All foreign languages are seen as imperialistic, and this affects 
learning because of the power of language. And he also writes that invention and innovation are not on the framework of Afrocentric language and meaning. So he raises some challenges that I think are important to address because there is this suspicion among certain populations that even by speaking Western languages, one is somehow introducing these elements of imperialism. And Transhuman Ape also wrote a similar comment. Uh, he writes, Transhum uh, Africans here don't trust transhumanism because they think it's a Trojan horse for hateful race science. And for us transhumanists, that may seem like an absurd kind of misconception. Uh, but of course, many Africans have had to deal with uh, essentially actual colonial occupation. And how do we convince the populations of various African countries or members of various tribal groups that transhumanism is not about that? Uh, we don't seek to colonize anybody. Uh, we just seek to bring the benefits of technological progress to Africans and have Africans participate in the transhumanist movement so that they could also benefit themselves and their fellow uh, countrymen and improve the standards of living. And we also hope that Africans can show some possibilities to the rest of the world because it does seem like the global west and the global east especially as epitomized by the united states and russia have come to an impasse a kind of civilizational dead end unfortunately as exemplified by this war in ukraine and what for uh, now almost two years has been a significant risk of a nuclear war. So clearly there's something about the perspectives of those great powers which is lacking, which is not compatible with the future progress of humankind. And we actually hope that Africans can help provide different perspectives so that we can leave this impasse so that we can enable the further progress of human civilization. So how can we break free of any associations of transhumanism with Western colonialism or imperialism? Is there a way to distance transhumanism from that? Or is it just a matter of time? Uh, would it take a few decades or a few generations before that association is broken. What do you think of that? All right, let me say something. To me, I believe for us to be able to make people understand transhumanism, especially in Africa, we should be able to form a kind of synergy between the common practice of uh, Africa, talking about our culture. I will want to give an example. In, uh, in our tribe, we have this kind of art people make for themselves, which can be used for assimilation when you are reading. So it's a kind of art prepared for all this traditional by prepared by all these traditional uh about doctor so if we can find a kind of synergy between that to make it to look like a new trophy and explain to people that this is what transhumanism is all about i guess we we can win a whole lot of people's art with that approach yes thank you josiah and we have several comments in our internal chat as well. Frederick writes that Africans are deeply influenced by traditional values which drive their religion uh, in essence. And Josue writes, 
to convince my compatriots, I tell them that with transhumanism, we're no longer behind the times because this is a new discipline for everyone, for Westerners and Africans alike. There is no imperialism. We just need to focus on research and research is universal. Yes, I really like those comments. I think the appeal to universal human values and the fact that transhumanism can benefit everybody in any country on any continent, no matter what the history of that place has been. Uh, I think that's very important to emphasize and that will help people throughout Africa. So now we have joining us Brenda Ramakapelwa. She is the CEO of TAFTS, the uh, Transdisciplinary Agora for Future Discussions, as well as one of the founders of Afro Longevity. So welcome, Brenda. We are quite pleased to have you here. And if you could provide us your comments about the state of transhumanism in Africa and the progress and advocacy efforts that have occurred uh, throughout the past several years. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and good evening to everybody. Um, so from uh, where I'm sitting, I am based in South Africa. So just a glance at the continent, I think uh, transhumanism is still very new um, as a concept in the, in the continent. Um, there's a lot of interest um, in what technology can do and how they can be used uh, to augment uh, with humans in terms of biology. Uh, because of the young population that we have in the continent, there's a lot of interest in what technology can do. There's a lot of interest in what science, um, when combined with technology from an innovative point of view, uh, can bring or help us in advancing um, the African uh, population. Um, but at the same time, this is met with a lot of skepticism um, in terms of um, what does this mean to us as natural beings? What does this mean to us from a religious point of view, cultural point of view, and all of that? So I think as much as uh, people are excited about what it can bring, there's still a lot of misunderstanding of what transhumanism is and the need for education across the continent. And um, I'm talking about Africa as a whole, but I think one thing that becomes an issue in Africa is that we tend to look at Africa as just one thing. When Africa is so diverse and um, a continent with totally different cultures. So therefore the reception of anything that is new will differ depending on where you are. People in the southern region of Africa might look at things quite differently from the people that are in the northern or western uh, region of Africa. So I think we, we, we for us to really get a sense of how this is being received or will advance in the continent. Um, we need to, you know, look at, you know, the, the, the continent as a whole, but we also need to delve into each country and um, look at, you know, how people are advancing from that point. Yes, thank you very much, Brenda, for those remarks. And we do have some feedback from uh, our commentators. Siba Chamuza writes, I prefer out of caution not to generalize because everyone in their individuality thinks differently within beliefs, as in belief systems, there are also debates. So that echoes uh, Brenda's comments as well as Osinakachi's comments earlier. And Edward Hudgens 
writes that the index of economic freedom shows the variability that Osunakachi mentions, but the index also shows some African countries of poor scores on the rule of law, property rights protections, and independent judiciaries. And following up on the earlier discussion, Mike Lazine writes that it is like the United Federation of Planets in the Star Trek universe being benevolent, but yet in the Star Trek universe, there are also alien species that look at the Federation as being uh, characterized by malevolence or deceit. So uh, it's often the case that if you, even if you have benevolent intentions, some people will be suspicious and some people will wonder, well, is this really a guise for something else? And it's important to overcome that and not just through our words, but through our example, through what we actually try to do, what we try to cultivate, and what we would like to uh, also see people in various parts of Africa accomplish by themselves, because we want African transhumanists to be leaders within the transhumanist community and within the world stage. We think that it doesn't just go one way. That is that the innovators in Africa will have a lot to teach us in the Western world, especially as time progresses, uh, as of course the dynamism of the African continent manifests itself. As you mentioned, Brenda, there are a lot of young people uh, on the African continent and as they hopefully will learn more about science and technology as they interact more with uh, other countries in the world, uh, they will contribute in terms of their capabilities for innovation. I think demographically, that's also very likely to happen because the average age in Western countries is increasing. There are some Western countries where the average age now is above 40. And the birth rates in Western countries are falling as well. So if we want to maintain the same kind of dynamism and productivity. We need to tackle this in multiple ways. We need to, first of all, extend lifespans and youthful lifespans here. We need to rely more on automation in order to undertake more of that productive work. But another significant tactic that we need to employ is immigration. So uh, we need to also have more Africans moving to Western countries and contributing to the economies there. Otherwise, we're going to see some severe demographic problems in the coming decades. Frederick also writes, we need to break the backstage ideologies, as he calls them. That is L standing for language barriers, I standing for information deficiency, M standing for mob thinking, I standing for impressions and T standing for thought patterns. And that acronym is LIMIT. So we need to break free of those limits. And Daniel Tweed writes, African diversity is a strength. So uh, a lot of very good comments were made here. And I would like to focus on this theme of African diversity what do you think are the most promising places in Africa where transhumanism could thrive? Those could be the most technologically advanced places, the places that are perhaps most culturally tolerant and would be receptive of transhumanist ideas. Uh, are there cities, countries, geographical regions where you think transhumanism could make the most progress in the near future. I would open this up to any of our guests from Africa. Any thoughts on this question? And we can come back to this as well, but Josiah, uh, if you have some thoughts on uh, what uh, are some right. of the- I think I think Ni Nigeria, Nigeria is a country where I think transhumanism can really thrive very fast uh, because the adoption rate of uh, technology nowadays is uh, is going exponentially 
stop. And if we can find, like I said earlier, a synergy between those technology and transhumanism, a lot of people are going to adopt the idea. Yes, thank you, Josiah. So Nigeria is a promising location for the advancement of transhumanism. And indeed, we've seen a lot of transhumanists come from Nigeria. So we've had many of them as guests on our uh, salons. Osinakachi, Akuma Kalu is an example. Frederick is an example. Uh, also, we had uh, Ugo Chukwu, and we had uh, Ugo Chukwu Alo as well as guests on our past salon. So Frederick, perhaps you would like to share some of your thoughts about where uh, some of the most promising places in Africa are for the advancement of transhumanism. Uh, uh, before I go further, I would like to share an idea. Um, you said something about automation. So we can really translate automation into ideation. Ideation in the sense that we use idea, ideology. We need to have fast track ideology that could spread transhumanism in Africa. So instead of only relying on, on automation, we can also build on ideation to be able to spread um, the awareness of transhumanism in Africa. Nigeria, as uh, my other colleague said, is a good place to start because Nigeria has a population and Nigeria also has uh, the individuals that can accelerate the penetration of transhumanism across Africa. Another Africa, other African continent, we have South Africa, we have Kenya, etc., etc., that we uh, make this possible. The penetration and the All right, thank you, Frederick. So, Frederick has coined this term ideomation, and uh, he wants to transition uh, automation into ideomation, so uh, a kind of process for the generation of ideas using advanced technology. Daniel Tweed writes, the African continent deserves to be more widely recognized as the motherland of both human evolution and human civilization. Well, yes, we did all evolve uh, from ancestors who originated on the African continent. So uh, that is correct. Anybody else in regard to the question of where the most promising places in Africa are for the development of transhumanism. I wonder, Brenda, if you could speak about South Africa and the climate of public opinion there, because South Africa is one of the most technologically advanced and economically developed countries in Africa. But uh, how is transhumanism perceived there? Any thoughts on that? I think we may have some. Yeah. I have the impression that there is some delay. I know yes. sometimes it happens that you, yeah. Yes, there's some lag in Brenda's connection. All right. Well, Ben, you had a question that dovetailed off of uh, some of what has been said. So please go ahead. I did wonder location wise if uh, there were different ways of uh, advocating transhumanism to urban and rural areas. I guess I'm speculating that in rural areas like education and electricity, medical care might just not be as accessible as in urban areas. And so to talk about the benefits of technological progress, there might be a different um, sell than it would be in urban areas where those things are more readily available. Yes, interesting question, Ben. So any comments on differences between urban and rural areas in terms of 
promotion of transhumanism or accessibility of transhumanist ideas. Frederick? Any thoughts on this? In, in Africa, there's a, seg a segmentation. Uh, the way people see it in Africa is those people living in the urban area are those people that, that are where to do. Why those people living in rural area are those people that are not where to do in terms of their, um, their income. So we use we use income to measure those people that are where to live in the urban area and those people living in the rural area, those people that are living, maybe they are peasant farmers, something like that. In the urban city, that is where um, the hustling and bustling takes place. So we can easily, the, the most important thing is for we to penetrate those eater lands, those places that transhumanism has not touched, the locals, those people living in the primitive part of Africa. Well, but Africa is developed because the way people paint Africa are like maybe people are living in the jungle, something like that. But if we can penetrate those places, there are talents there that we can harness, that we can harvest, whereby they can easily project um, and make transhumanism go viral within Africa. So that is it for me. Yes, those are very good points, Frederick. And there is a lot of untapped talent in the rural parts of Africa because essentially uh, a lot of our technologies have not fully penetrated there yet. But if people are provided with some exposure to the ideas of transhumanism, perhaps they would be receptive as it could so obviously help with their standards of living. Now, Brenda, you are back. And the question was for you in terms of South Africa and how receptive people in South Africa have been to transhumanism in your view, as well as what is the potential for South Africa to become a hub of transhumanist activity in the future? Um, so I, I really think that as far as I'm not going to say transhumanism at this point. As far as science and technology reception um, in South Africa, that is one of the top things that, you know, young people here, even older people, you know, are really excited about and wanting to see what technology is bringing and how do we combine the two to ensure that it benefits us as, as a community. So I therefore think that because of that, because of that excitement about invention and innovation, uh, South Africa can be one of those areas that really, really, you know, take transhumanism um, from where it's at in Africa to the next level. Uh, the one thing that I've always find, found that is, becomes a bit of a challenge in South Africa, in some parts of um, the African continent, in other countries here, is that we tend to come up with things and expect people to just adopt them. And in most cases, they don't work for them. So the one thing, and that is why I'm always talking about education and creating awareness as far as these new concepts or these new, new ideas coming into the continent or into the different countries, is that um, we don't stop and think, where is the maturity level as far as, for example, technology is concerned in that particular country? If I come up with an idea like this or an invention or innovation like this, will it work for those people in that country? Will they understand it the way it is meant to be understood? What is it that I need to do to ensure that they get what I'm trying to, uh, to communicate? So I think we need to, for us to be able to really, um, I don't want to use the word sell, but I, I don't know what the, I, I'm running out of, you know, I don't know what the other word is, but to sell the idea to them, to get the buy-in that we want um, is, to ensure that people understand what transhumanism is in their language, as in, you know, why is it important to me? What is it gonna do for me? 
you know, how do I use it to advance myself? How is this going to benefit me? And most importantly, my community, because remember in Africa, Ubuntu uh, remains one of the core principles. How does this benefit me and my community? So once people understand that and understand the use of this, understand what it means for them and their communities, it becomes easier to then say, to, for them to then say, okay, now what is it? Wanting to understand it more, being able to embrace it, understanding its dangers and also understanding its opportunities so that they know what to pursue and what to avoid. So um, South Africa, I think, you know, it's already there. There's a lot of uh, technological innovations that are happening here. There's a lot of invention and innovation that is happening in the country. Excitement about what's coming down the line. But I think South Africa, just like any other African country or any other country in the world, um, wants to advance. And transhumanism might be that opportunity to do that, might open that door that people are seeking. Um, for people to start understanding exactly, you know, what is coming down the line and how to best use it to advance it. So I think for me is to tap, is to, to, to be able to tap into what people see as their challenges and understand from them what are the things that they are looking for to be able to solve those challenges not just push things down their throat, but work with them to understand and not assume we know what the problems is and use these technologies to help them solve their own problems, get them involved. Um, and that's the only way I think we can get the buy-in. And with that, I think we can get the buy-in anyway, regardless of where they are from the mature, in terms of technological maturity levels or uh, educational maturity levels. That just means that, you know, instead of doing it in, at this level, we will do it at that level. But I think the, it, it can be easily bought into, it can easily be adopted and embraced. Yes. Thank you very much, Brenda. And yes, it is indeed important to recognize essentially the needs of people in various communities and the nuances of that. That's why it is important ideally to have transhumanists on the ground in as many countries and as many cities as possible, people who are of those communities but who find some affinity to the ideas of transhumanism and then they see what those needs are and they see how to frame the broader transhumanist concepts in a way that could get people to recognize oh these ideas actually have applications whereby they could solve the particular problems that are most pressing and of greatest concern to people. So uh, definitely very important to consider. And Carlos Nato agrees. He says, great comment, Brenda. I think a good approach is it is good because you are not supposed to die or age. You can have a choice. And this is indeed an area where I think all of humankind has a common problem and that is aging, the decay of the body, the increased susceptibility to disease that currently accompanies advanced age, but hopefully it will not have to in the future. We also have an interesting comment by Josue Gabo. He writes, in my view, transhumanism is a major opportunity because by multiplying human capabilities tenfold, we can develop these products, but under development, is precisely the opposite of augmentation. Technological backwardness has only one remedy, human augmentation. And Josue writes further that while it may seem to concern only advanced nations, the transhumanist project is well and truly at work in Africa. But in an increasingly secular society, who sets the rules for evolution and normality? African societies need to redefine their vision of man, but even more so, they need to question man's relationship 
to the demands of transhumanism. Such a reflexive effort must be at one with a political and civic approach, urging Africa's state powers to make contact with the promoters of transhumanist science. In this way, national decision makers would reserve for themselves an essential place in the overall policies designed to lead to the increase in capacities. Transhumanism is only likely to be successful in terms of living together if the state takes care to organize in one way or another national solidarity in this area in terms of both rights and duties. And Frederick writes that we need to first build an on ideomation firsthand, followed by adoption, automation, and augmentation. So this concept of ideomation is a prerequisite to the others in Frederick's view. Josiah suggests that we can use the approach of creating transhuman clubs in different universities. And indeed, I would encourage everyone to go to our transhuman club website at transhuman.club and see what ideas could be adopted from there and adapted to uh, particular educational institutions in Africa. Also, anybody is welcome to create an account on transhuman.club and start adding content, including content that would be relevant to transhumanism in Africa. So thank you for all of those comments. And now I would invite Art Ramon to ask a question of our guests. Uh, yeah, um, I think several, ye several years ago, we had a guest uh, from Nigeria, Calvin Dia Dafiador, and he's an instructor there in Nigeria. And I asked him a question, and what he answered just kind of shocked me. I asked him, has he seen Black Panther? And he told me no. And I just kind of found that shocking that, you know, he's teaching, uh, you know, science-based uh, courses there at his school, but he hasn't even seen Black Panther. And, you know, that's kind of along Western uh, Afrofuturism. Now, we have that here in the West. I mean, Michael Jackson and, and Janet Jackson used to always, you know, sing like they just stepped out of a starship. And I think probably what, to, what you need to do to promote uh, transhumanism after is get your own style of Afrofuturism because uh, Afrofuturism is, you know, based here in America. It's created by Americans. So there in Africa, you should start to promote the arts, you know, have singers, artists, and, and so forth, and have sort of that marketing side of transhumanism through advertisement and, and arts and the media, and, and sort of create your own version of Afrofuturism, African futurism. So I think that's what's missing, because if you just throw out, you know, transhumanism, you know, it's still, I mean, it's here in the States, it's hard, you know, to get that message across. So you need something a little easier for people to grab onto, and that's going to be science fiction. So, you know, uh, promote and create some sort of African, uh, you know, futurism in, in, with the arts, I think, is what's needed. So, uh, I mean, has anyone there uh, in, in your respective countries seen any sort of, uh, you know, arts that comes close to being like Afrofuturism? Interesting question. Any thoughts from uh, our guests from Africa about Afrofuturism and how common is it as a genre in African countries that you're familiar with? Do a lot of people uh, whom you know watch or read science fiction or futurist fiction? Any comments on that? Well, while you're thinking about this, Frederick has uh, an explanation about some of the terms that he used. So he says ideomation equals information creation, adoption equals wide acceptance, automation equals advanced machination, and augmentation equals sophistication. So 
that's the sequence of events that Frederick considers to be necessary. And now we also have some comments from our YouTube audience. Uh, Edward Hudgens writes that uh, per Ben's question in rural areas, most people are just concerned with the basics. He also writes many healthcare workers and physicians in the US are Nigerians. Edward has encountered many even in the past week. Nigeria has talent, but uh, he has talked to them about why they come to the US rather than staying in Nigeria. So there may be some difficulties in Nigeria that they are trying to escape essentially by coming to the US and that's quite understandable. Now, Sergei Gupkin writes that popularizing transhumanism in Africa is important as he believes Asia and Africa are our great hope because there's not as much intellectual opposition to transhumanism in Africa, Asia, and Latin America as there is in the West. Well, it seems that the accounts that we've heard differ a bit. There uh, are still the people who think that transhumanism is somehow associated with Satanism. Uh, so there are fundamentalist religious opponents, even uh, in various African countries. And as Carlos Nato pointed out in Latin America, uh, there are fundamentalist religious opponents to transhumanism as well. It seems in all parts of the world we have are challenges, but they're different challenges. So uh, Sergei writes, for instance, even Russian intellectuals are more positive about transhumanism as in the West aging and especially death acceptance discourse was just too strong uh, in the Western intellectual tradition. And I agree based on my personal impressions in the former Soviet Union, there isn't as much ideological opposition to transhumanism or life extension. A lot of people would just say life is so bad right now and there are so many immediate problems that it's impractical, but they don't say that it's undesirable. Uh, so uh, by the way, uh, Sergei uh, wrote that the death acceptance discourse was very strong in the Western tradition during de-Christianization. And it's interesting. Yes, in the West, sometimes we even encounter atheists who will say, well, uh, we should just accept death as part of the natural way of things. They sometimes say we should accept it for ecological reasons or because we are all stardust and it's not anything bad that we die. Or uh, some will say, well, we were lucky to even have been born, so why complain about dying? And I don't agree with any of those arguments, even though I am an atheist myself. But thank you for those remarks. Now, uh, let us go to Daniel for uh, a further question from him. Yes, uh, I'm uh, happy to see our friends from the mother continent here. You, you know, Africa does have, I believe, the most uh, amount of equatorial uh, land mass and hence um, the most solar influx because that's highest at the equator but uh, i also think it's a great opportunity for seasteading kinds of arrangements it's got huge coastline and of course on the equator is the most uh, hospitable place to put floating habitats or um, even anchored ones so uh, and there, there's a huge labor pool uh, you know the sea is really uh, our stepping stone to our space future as I um, would advocate. And uh, so I, I also think that, uh, you know, the idea of Pan-Africanism was proposed by many scholars and activists, but uh, I would propose that a pan-tribalist confederation it would be the good uh, manifestation of that. Uh, federalism is the idea that uh, we're all under a unified control system, but if you look at the root of the word uh, fedares, Confidaris means faith in each other. And uh, if you have tribes that are aggregating, you know, with a, a, a faith in each other kind of thing, rather than faith in some hierarchical control god or, you know, giant uh, control government, uh, 
of course, uh, the word, you know, confederation has a bad word, because, bad, a bad taste because we had the Civil War uh, with a confederacy. But I mean, really, um, confederation is is actually a great way to do pan-tribal Africanism. <laughs> so um, and I think tribalism is not a bad thing if, if it makes uh, people more self-governing and more uh, familiar with their neighbors. So maybe some response to <laughs> some of those ideas, uh, anyone? Let's see, any responses to Daniel's questions about the prospects for some sort of pan-Africanism based on uh, tribal connections or uh, seasteading, uh, for instance, as a way to pursue transhumanism maybe in coastal areas of Africa. Any thoughts on either of those? Brenda, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, before I, I, I respond to the, the this question, I wanted to respond to the previous one, if I may. Um, the question around Afrofuturism and uh, the view on Black Panther and all of that. Um, so I wanted to just say that, you know, Black Panther was good uh, for the most of the people that I know of, at least in South Africa, I know it was well received. There was excitement about the whole Wakanda thing. I think the only issue that might be there, or at least from you know the few people that I spoke to in the reviews of this thing, was about sometimes how Africa is depicted because it is not, uh, most of these projects are not done by Africans, as you said. Uh, with Black Panther, there was a lot of South Africans um, in the movie, but um, it was not really a true reflection of um, what Africa is about. I know it's what we would want it to be, it being a superpower and all of that. So I think, um, you know, it is right that, you know, we need to start doing things and, you know, um, kind of positioning them or showing them the way we see the future Africa to be. And one of the most uh, difficult things uh, that we face with is the, the lack of infrastructure to do that, the lack of funding to do that, the lack of resources, because there's a lot of brain drain in Africa. Most of our people will be as brilliant as they are, as talented as they are, but because there are no opportunities in Africa, they will move and probably, you know, go to the US or go to Europe uh, to pursue those opportunities. There is a need for us to bring their talent back to Africa. There is a need for us to develop ourselves in Africa and uh, really put some of that talent on the table for, for, for the people to see. But also, I think a call for our global collaborators to also, you know, um, listen more to what Africa has to say and pay attention to what the real Africa is by listening to the people that are here um, taking into consideration their lived experiences, not just consuming what the media is putting out there. So I think collaboration in this case means we all listen to each other. We all take into consideration the needs, the wants of uh, what, what, what Africa sees as its future. Uh, that is the only way I see us seeing Africa for what it is, not what we think it is or what we've been told it is. So um, there's a lot of uh, consumption of sci-fi and wanting to put that. I know a lot of people that have put some of those projects together, but because they do not have the funds to put them at the, at the level of your Hollywood type movies, it, is, it becomes very difficult for the world to see those. So, but I think there's a lot of appetite to do more of those. And I see that coming up in the future. Um, the, 
next question around pan-Africanism. I think um, also there's a lot of appetite for that. And I think it's a great idea for us to start looking at uh, research around what's available in our coastal area and a bit more study on that. There hasn't been enough of that. Um, and I think it will be such a, you know, I think it's a brilliant idea to start in, to start looking at what that has to offer and what can that um, mean uh, for us, even uh, to the globe in terms of uh, research and what we might find if we start uh, pursuing such opportunities. Yes, thank you very much, Brenda, for both of your answers on the subjects of science fiction as well as Pan-Africanism. And Francois Joanneau also contributed on the seasteading question. He writes, seasteading is the way to save natural spaces. Seasteading will bring opportunities to African shores. There is no need to seek opportunities in industrialized countries. We can bring industry close to Africa. So thank you for those thoughts, Francois. And now let's go to Didier. Yeah, uh, I would like to uh, come back to a few things, but first to say that I uh, totally agree uh, with what uh, Brenda uh, said about uh, uh, let's say what's sometimes called uh, uh, brain drain. So uh, it is uh, great for Europe uh, and for the US to benefit from uh, high level uh, people coming from Africa, but it's uh, it can be a big problem from uh, for Africans themselves and for uh, let's say uh, progress in Africa. And uh, yes, <laughs> sea stealing, sea stealing, yeah, it could be an idea. But uh, for me, uh, one of the, uh, the big problems uh, at the moment is still a technological one. The fact that, and we see that uh, here, but uh, uh, not only here, that um, internet uh, access is now a reality in most uh, African, in all African countries. But uh, very fast internet access is not a reality yet. Uh, so uh, progress for this, uh, I think, is very, very important. I am curious if uh, um, African transhuman industry uh, think the same. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The, the second thing is uh, um, uh, concerning uh, this... Uh, let's say, link uh, between uh, uh, African culture and transhumanism. I ask uh, uh, Armand Gertschetka, sorry, I cannot pronounce it, uh, to to told me and he gave me, he gave me the information. This, it's about, among other things, the epic of the African Mvet. This is an imaginary central African tale of human uh, perfection through a mystical transmutation of metal and flesh giving the warriors of the Engong people not only invulnerability, but also physical immortality. So there are tales in uh, Africa about uh, immortality, about uh, yeah, transhumanism, even, uh, even if it is not with this uh, uh, name. And then the last thing uh, that I wanted to say, uh, it's about... Uh, yeah, uh, what uh, Brenda and Osina uh, told us, and uh, I, of course, agree that Africa is not one unity, but uh, um, there are some common aspects, like Europe is not a unity, but there are some uh, common aspects, you know. And concerning uh, Europe and Africa compared to North America, uh, one big difference is uh, the diversity of languages. It's, I think, I don't know exactly, but I think, uh, no, uh, I think the, uh, diversity of languages is higher in Africa, but diversity in, uh, of languages in, uh, in, in Europe is uh, very high uh, uh, as well. Uh, so like uh, in my country, uh, we have already a uh, Three, three official languages, and most people speak English as well. So French, uh, uh, Dutch, uh, and German are the three official languages. 
And even in a city like uh, my city, Brussels, very multicultural city, uh, yeah, there are big differences between the western part, who is uh, poor, where I live, and the eastern part, rich. Not the same way to speak, even. Okay, that's uh, what I uh, wanted uh, to say. Uh, and and maybe the, the last thing, uh, I, I was uh, interested by what you say about uh, Afro-Futurism, uh, especially uh, you, Brenda. But I would like to know um, if you speak about Afrofuturism to uh, people in South Africa, let's say, and in Niger, Niger because we have people from uh, Niger and from South Africa and from uh, uh, Ivory Coast. Is it a word that uh, people, uh, let's say, know about it or it's kind of uh, people don't know about it? Thank you. So, so maybe in response to Didier, uh, yes, in South Africa, uh, so I can speak about South Africa because I'm here. So this is the world that people know about. Um, uh, they are very much interested in that. They really want to uh, start thinking about what would Africa look like um, in the future, but also they imagined Africa. Uh, there's a lot of young people I mean, even in the the the, the arts and create, in creative arts, um, they are music, they are dances, um, uh, they are plays. Uh, you see elements of uh, science fiction coming in. Um, a lot of the, the the short films that they do, as I said, from a arts and culture point of view, because we were talking specifically about. Black Panther and 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 such as uh, such movies, there is there is thinking and there is action around that. So you can see that people, you know, uh, are starting to imagine what um, a future Africa uh, Africa will start to be. And I think in a lot of African countries, is the thing is, I'm not in a position to say this is what Nigeria would think or this is what Kenya would say. Only the people that are in those countries will say. But obviously, because there is social media and all of that, there are conversations that are happening with young people from all of these uh, different countries. And you can see I mean, people are really forward thinkers. And um, it's not only about what I think it can be, but how real is it? You know, what can I start doing now? Uh, when you look at some of the projects that the, some of these kids are doing in academic institutions, um, you can see that they are uh, future driven and technologically driven. So um, as I said, most of these things is about um, finding a way of, or an opportunity to ensure that they are showcased for the world to see and also uh, when that happens, when they get that exposure, that the, the, the people outside of Africa, you know, can put trust in what Africa presents, can buy into it the same way that when I get something from Europe or from the US, I get excited about. Uh, one of the things over and above brain drain that we're struggling with is it's almost like if something comes from Africa, it has to be questioned a lot of times. People have got to think, you know, is it really real? So we need to change the narrative about um, things not being good enough when it comes from Africa, but also instilling that confidence in Africans to say, you actually can do it. What you are doing is good enough. It's not gonna be shoved, but also um, for the world to start accepting, recognizing, and um, ensuring that um, all of those ideas that are coming out from Africa um, are good, can be developed for the benefit of Africa, not to be taken away from Africa and be brought back uh, for African to then come and see them as not their own. So I think it's a the collaborative efforts that is required here is 
for us as Africans to start doing things for ourselves and having confidence in what we can do and how well we can do it, but also for the world outside of Africa to start accepting, you know, what's coming out of Africa as good enough to be consumed by them and also as competitive enough to be at the same level as uh, what comes outside of Africa. Yes, thank you very much, Brenda, for those remarks. And Francois Joanneau writes that he trusts African potential. He also writes on the subject of internet access, very high speed internet can run along the shores. And yes, I think improving internet connectivity in Africa is one of the foremost advances that could very quickly improve the productivity, the connectedness of many Africans, as well as the kind of perception that you discussed. Mike Lazine uh, says, good point, and the main fiber optic cables from the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean can be tied to the fiber optic lines on the African coast. So perhaps there's not as much of the uh, let's say, basic uh, building or laying of these cables that would need to be done since the major connections are already there. Uh, just some of the coastal cables would need to be laid. So those are interesting remarks. And Frederick writes, we need to internalize the transhumanism penetration in Africa to effectively make transhumanism penetrate deeply into Africa, we must marry transhumanism with empathism first and foremost. And that's an interesting term there, empathism. And I think that speaks to what Brenda was talking about in terms of understanding the needs in particular communities and how transhumanist ideas can help people resolve those problems that they consider to be foremost. So all very interesting and important thoughts. So we have about seven minutes left in our virtual enlightenment salon. There is an interesting question that I would like to get our guests' opinions on, and then we could hear some closing comments. And this comes from uh, Osfranta Rufus, who wonders, is China doing a net positive or negative in developing massive construction projects in Africa? And this has been a subject touched upon in our YouTube chat. Some people are more optimistic. Some people are more skeptical about Chinese involvement. What about what you observe in your countries? Is there extensive uh, Chinese involvement in terms of construction projects or economic partnerships? And what would you say the impact of that has been if it has been significant? It looks like uh, we have well, Josiah. Well, yes. Well, so, so, so me in Nigeria, coming from the manufacturing uh, sector, especially with my IoT experience. China involvement in, uh, in Africa, especially in Nigeria, has been a little bit of benefit to us because most of our designs, our manufacturing processes and everything are being done by Chinese due to the connection and the uh, synergy we have with them. So basically, it's on positive side to us. That's all I can say. Yes, thank you, Josiah. And Brenda, do you have any observations about uh, the extent of, let's say, Chinese impact on South Africa or other African countries? Um, in the past, my view has, it has been very low. But uh, in the past few years, um, uh, let me start from a political point of view. There's been a lot of interaction, a lot of um, in 
I want to be careful with what I'm saying. Um, the relationship is way better than it used to be um, from a political point of view. In terms of impact and on the ground change that we are seeing, there is a lot of that in terms of trade and all of that. But for me, I have not seen it where I think it can be more helpful. Africa is mostly rural. The impact that we are seeing from China or any other country that has got those uh, relationships with African countries, South Africa specifically, uh, that change we are, seeing, we are seeing more in the cities. And it looks like from a layman, it benefits the people that already have you know, opportunities, the people that are already there. It's yet to affect or impact the people that are on the ground, the people that need uh, that change more. I am hoping that with what we've seen, especially during COVID and, you know, um, from 2020 up to now, which has been a significant change from a health point of view, from an infrastructure point of view, um, and trade point of view, that that will start to trickle down to the rural areas and start to benefit the poor that it needs to benefit. Um, I'm always a bit careful or skeptical about uh, relationships that are deemed to benefit Africans, but the benefits just ends at the top layers don't really benefit the majority of the community. So yes, we have seen the change. Yes, um, there's a lot of trade that we are seeing because we are in the city and we can see it at high level. But if you ask the question to a person in the village um, or in the outskirts of the city, um, the answer that you are most likely to get is no. Yes, thank you very much, Brenda. So it seems there is a differential impact between urban and rural areas. And as is often the case, the urban areas, the more developed areas are getting more of the benefit. But as the previous conversation has emphasized, we want to see the benefits spread to the rural areas. There's a lot of untapped potential there as well. What's interesting, though, is South Africa has been one of the countries where the Sinovac COVID vaccine from China was actually authorized. So this was a way in which China has interacted with South Africa, which has not been so much the case in the United States or in Europe. Certainly, we don't have Sinovac available in the United States, though, uh, of course, from the Transhumanist Party standpoint, we want all vaccines available everywhere so that people could make a choice among as many alternatives as possible. But uh, there have been some ties, there have been some connections. So we have about a minute left in our virtual enlightenment salon today. And I would like to thank all of our guests, Brenda, Josiah, Frederick, and Didier for helping us moderate this panel. I think it was an exceptional discussion about the promise of transhumanism in Africa, as well as the challenges that transhumanism faces. And they are, to some extent, different challenges than exist in the Western world, but there are some commonalities. For instance, the unawareness problem is one that we face. There is some opposition from religious fundamentalists as well. And that seems to be a problem that manifests in some flavors throughout the world. But also, I think this discussion underscored the importance of building local transhumanist hubs so that in many African countries, we could have leaders who are driving the transhumanist movement forward. And we are fortunate to have such leaders among us today. 
and those include Brenda and Josiah and Frederick and Josue, who was there previously, Haman, uh, who unfortunately had some connectivity issues, but let's improve internet access in Africa so that he could join us in the future. And thank you, of course, to Daniel and Ben and Art Ramon for joining us. Thank you, as always, to our very involved and curious audience. Let us all live long and prosper. <laughs>